Ready? Let's do it. Power at the radio. I was at Summer Strong and heard Woods- Woodski's talk on supplements. I forgot to ask which creatine is the best one to take. Thanks for your time. Creatine. So I did not know this little fact, but it turns out creatine was first synthesized in like the 1800s and has been around for many, many years. I first heard about creatine in 1990, 1991 from George Angus. George came home with like this big box we, we, where we came over to lift weights and he had come home with these big boxes and it was just this white powder in like a white bottle with no labels. And he said, hey, take a teaspoon of this twice a day and let me know how you do. So we started taking creatine and all of a sudden, uh, you know, recovery got better. We seemed to be getting bigger. We seemed to be getting stronger and pretty much have taken creatine uh, nonstop since 1990. Um, at that time, the only creatine available was called creatine monohydrate. Uh, but over the years, they've developed a bunch of different versions of creatine. And uh, we can do a little deep dive. I actually pulled up some inf- information. For those of you guys who don't know, creatine is all about ATT or ATP production. So creatine phosphate, cellular energy production through ATP. And ATP is endos... I mess up these words all the time. It's andosine triphosphate. So that's the powerhouse. That's the energy to the cell. When you're producing energy, you're producing uh, ATP. So creatine aids in that. Now, the first one, basic creatine monohydrate, was the first one I took. And really the one that I've taken predominantly over the last decades. Uh, But I did a little Google search on the different versions of creatine. Now, there's a lot. Everybody's tried to come back and put their own spin on creatine to improve upon it, to make it and sell it. Uh, the first one was called creatine ethyl ester. So that was one they were trying to basically create an ester out of the ethyl for the creatine. And if you look at the effects and all the research they've done, no difference, right, from creatine monohydrate. Uh, the other one was creatine hydrochloride. Uh, that one was uh, uh, allegedly more water soluble. So creatine's a white powder. You put it into you know water, or we were always told to put it into grape juice. So they could act, it could use the sugar, insulin, blood sugar deal as mm-hmm. a transport. And we thought that it could get creatine in the, in the muscle faster. I don't know if that one, that one's still out, but that was how we did it. We always took it with grape juice. Um, is it more water soluble? Yes. Does it increase absorption? Maybe. Is it better? Marginally. Like the effects in the studies I looked at really didn't show anything significant. It just was easier to mix. So if you were going to put it in water, it was simpler. Uh, Number five was liquid creatine. Um, Back in the day, it was called creatine, and there was a company that made a liquid creatine. Uh, Yeah, I remember those those drops. Everybody in high school. Dude, super expensive. So what they did is they took creatine monohydrate. They somehow, you know, basically put it into a liquid. Now, the one thing I liked about it is it wasn't as messy. So you could throw it in your gym bag. You could take it. Like almost like you could take creatine over the course of the entire day at post-workout, you know, whatever it was, because it was just was in like a bottle and you just kind of poured it in. Um, They had a ton of research where they were like, oh, it's 40% better and the effects and whatever. All the research I looked at, pretty much the same as creatine monohydrate. But the one plus is that it's cleaner, less messy. You don't have any white chalky powder and you can take it with you and it was just easier to consume. So the next one was called magnesium chelate. And that one also was no better than creatine monohydrate. So the six that I didn't, and there, there was a bunch, man. Like when I, when I say there was a bunch, I just picked out kind of the six that were, you know, obviously came up the most yeah. and those were those. But when I started combing through the research, and not to say I dug through every single research that I did, I looked at 100 peer-reviewed articles, I glanced at a few, uh, the results when compared to creatine monohydrate were pretty much the same. So the recommendation is find a creatine monohydrate from a reputable source. Don't buy it from, you know, off of Amazon, from someplace out of China. You know, I mean, I like the Thorn stuff. The Thorn is a little bit more expensive. But I order other stuff from Thorne, and so I just get creatine from them. But to go online, find a reputable brand. There's, uh, don't buy into any of the marketing associated with it. Just the basic creatine monohydrate, and that's the one. Now, a couple caveats. Creatine is not a steroid. You don't have to 
cycle it. And I get this all <laughs> the time where people are like, should I cycle on and off? No. Well, where, where do you feel that uh, came yeah. from? Like there's this weird thought that if something is performance enhancing, you have to cycle it. And I think that comes from like maybe Dan Duchesne's steroid Bible, or maybe it comes from, you know, some other stuff like so much. So I got a question the other day from, uh, from one of my, uh, personal clients asking about cycling blood flow restriction training. Like, should I cycle on and off? And I'm like, it's not a steroid. <laughs> like, are you making gains? Like what we found was that five days of BFR was too much, two to three days, um, alternating between like two upper, one lower two lower one upper kind of a deal was really the sweet spot for it. And my comment was, are you still getting performance gains out? Are you feeling better? It's like, yeah, I'm getting stronger. I feel more jacked. I'm leaner. I'm do I'm feeling like a million bucks. Well then, you know what? Keep doing it. You don't have to cycle off it. Like it's a steroid. Um, creatine is not a steroid, so you don't have to cycle on and off or I don't even know if people cycle on and off steroids. Um, you know, I've had some clients hit me up that are on TRT that just take the same amount you know, and then they go and they get their blood work and they might adjust based on some other factors. But I think that cycling stuff really came down to uh, people taking a ton of steroids. Like, uh, hey, I'm going to base this thing with tests and I'm going to take orals and all these other different injectables. And the problem is the toxicity was so high that they had to take them in short periods to actually give their you know, organs and their body a time to recover. So creatine is not like this. It's not a hormone. It's not messing you up in any way. What it's doing is it's providing ATP, uh, which is increasing, um, you know, energy for the cell, but also, and Derek brought this up in our pre in our podcast, that's coming out tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, <laughs> about it's a neuroprotectant. And I've always wondered if maybe one of the reasons that I did not develop the same amount of brain damage or brain issues, or if that maybe the stuff that happened was able to recover a little faster because I was a continuous creatine user. So I've been saying it for 10 years, every vertebrae on the planet should take it. If you got bones in your body, you should be taking creatine. Um, if you are an athlete that involves using your head as a battering ram, like a rugby, hockey, football, whatever it is, you should be taking creatine monohydrate. And if you are a performance athlete or looking for longevity or looking to start off some form of uh, you know, mental decline, I think ATP, I think anybody who is in that 40, 50 year old range should be taking it. So pretty much everybody should be taking it. I'm a great train and I'm right on track. I'm smoking.